a world of disagreements, large and small. I don't believe that you exist. Go think whatever you want. Go ahead. How can a good and powerful God allow innocent people to suffer unspeakable tragedies? But then there's all these questions, you know, about ethics and moral issues as well. And I would say, well, they're crazy for not testing what they think they believe. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. It's as real as what you see. And, and I begin with the assumption that God is love. And love is love is love is love. Is love. I think that the Orthodox historic Christian tradition is this vast, diverse conversation that's been going on for thousands of years. Open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. The passage that we're going to be looking at this morning is really about us being certain that we do actually have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. John wants to make sure that we're not kidding ourselves, that we're not playing some religious game, that we're not deceiving ourselves in some way, because really what's at stake here when it comes right down to it is eternity. It's where you spend forever. That to me sounds like it would probably be a pretty important thing to be sure about and not to leave to some kind of a guess. And so he wants to write here so that he can help remove people's doubts because at this point within the church, people were doubting whether they were a part of it. Did they really believe? Did they you know, know what it meant? And so let's stop and let's look at the passage. Let's read through the passage together and then we'll go back and break it down as we go here. 1 John chapter 2, look at verses 3 through 6. John writes and he says in verse 3, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, did you notice that one word kept coming up in that passage over and over again? The word no. Four times there in those four verses, the word no pops up. In fact, this is such an important term and it's more important thought here that it actually comes up about 25 times in the whole letter of 1 John that we know or we perceive something to be true. It's a pretty important part of all this. The context here is that you would know that you know Christ. There's no issue. There's no guessing. And remember what John is doing is he's responding to these false teachers so at this time in an area there in Asia Minor, you had a group of people that were coming along and saying, look, it's possible for you to have fellowship with God and then do whatever you want, live any way you want to, have no moral boundaries whatsoever, do whatever you want, because listen, after you've made this decision to come you know, and believe in Christ you know, and your spirit is sort of connected with God, nothing matters that you do in the flesh at all, and you can do anything you want, God doesn't care about it because you really don't even sin anymore. And so he writes at the beginning of chapter 1 here in verse 8, and he says this. He says, look, if you say you have no sin, you're kidding yourself. You're deceiving yourself. Then he comes right back in verse 9, and he says, look, if you just go to the Lord and ask him to forgive you, he will forgive you. And, and by the way, you get to chapter 2, and he says, look, you can trust that God is going to do this because you actually have an advocate. You have an attorney that's with the Father, Jesus so you're going to be okay. Again, the problem here is the Gnostics, this group of people that thought it was all about head knowledge and the things that they know. They were teaching that sin is not only okay, it's completely inevitable. You have flesh, and so you're just going to do it, so don't worry about it. God doesn't care about it. He doesn't count it against you. It has no effect on you at all. And so John is writing to say that's not true. Sin does matter to God. It does create an issue for us. It creates doubt inside of us. It reveals things about us, including actually maybe we don't believe. So what John's going to do here in verses 3 through 6, he's going to give us three evidences here that we actually can know for certain that you and I have a personal relationship with Christ Christ 
if these things are true of us, there's the evidence of obedience, the evidence of maturity. In other words, my faith is sort of growing. And then there's the evidence of lifestyle. Okay, so let's look at the first one here in verses 3 and 4 and the issue of obedience. Go back to verse 3 here. He says, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, the statement he makes right at the very beginning there is he says this, And by this, and the this he is referring to is keeping his commandments. Now, what he's saying here is that we can know that we know Christ, that we have a personal relationship with Christ by simply keeping his commandments. That means that that obedience at this point is an evidence of our faith. Now, let me tell you what he's not saying here. What he's not saying here is you're saved by obedience. He's not saying that. I want to be really clear here that you catch that. He's not saying you're saved by your works. He's not saying you're saved by just doing everything that God is asking you. What he's saying is keeping the commandments is a sign of your salvation. It's an evidence. It really comes down to, as people, do we believe that when we enter into a personal relationship with Christ, does Christ change me? And in the midst of that change, him putting his spirit inside of us to live inside of us, does that cause me to start to turn and walk like he wants me to walk? Well, I think the scriptures would say yes. Keep your finger here, and I want you to go over to the right, or to the left, excuse me, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul here writes... And he says this in chapter 5, verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in other words, stop, look up for a second. Being in Christ in this place would be, you know, meaning you have a relationship with him. You believe, you've trusted in him, okay? He's therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Jesus would have described it like this. You've been born again, born brand new, had a spiritual birth in your life. And the old things, all of your old life has been taken away and he's put new life in you and yet you still have to learn to live on in the flesh. Jesus would would add this because John's message here has really never changed from the very beginning. If you're in Corinthians, go back over the left even further and go to John chapter 14 in the Gospel of John. John chapter 14 because his message has not changed from this letter and the same things that he said in the gospel there. In John chapter 14, he says this, starting at verse 15. He says, if you love me, you'll do whatever you want. No. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Go over to chapter 15. Look at verse 14. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. It's an easy way to remember them, that they both almost say the same thing. Jesus wasn't stopping at that point and giving pointers on life. It wasn't like he stopped and he goes, hey, guys, you know, there's some things I would just love for you to do. These are commands. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. Now, go back again to 1 John chapter 2 here. Go back to verse 3 again one more time. He says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. That word there, keep, is a military term, terio. It stresses the idea of of being observant and watchful and sort of knowing the role that you have and, and who you are and whose you are. It's the idea that you don't forget those things. You don't, you don't forget for the fact that you, you're on duty that night. Let me give you an example how that might work out in, in my life. Like I'm married. I never forget that my wife, Gayla, is over here. I don't, and never forget that she's my wife. Never. I never forget that I have three children. Not that hard. I never forget that I'm a grandfather. It's not that hard. Well, the point being is I also never forget that Jesus died for me and lives inside of me. 
I know. I keep that. It holds on to me. I know that he saved me. I know that he walks and loves me. Even though I'm not perfect, I know whose I am. Now verse 3 is telling us here that salvation is evidenced then by our obedience. Obedience then leads to assurance, which, we get, which means we know him. And so the first evidence of our salvation is obedience. And by the way, that's a, that is a consistent message in the scriptures, that you and I would come to faith in Christ and then that we would learn to be obedient. In Ephesians chapter 2, when, when Paul writes and he talks about grace by being saved by grace and by no work whatsoever, then he follows that up in chapter 2 verse 10 and he says, and we were created for good works. So that grace and a good work always follows after it. Romans chapter 8, when Paul writes, you know, there and talks about these, the beauty of what God is doing in our life, he stops and he says, look, justification is always accompanied by sanctification. In other words, God keeps working. He didn't just save you, now he becomes to live inside of you and help you live this life. James chapter 2, faith, he tells us, is always seen in works. It's not the works that save me. They just come out as a result of me being saved. Truth always expresses itself in actions. Notice here in verse 3 that John doesn't say we hope or we think or we wish. He says we know. We are continually perceiving here something by experience. We just know it. Assurance comes in because we experience God's presence in our lives as we obey him. Now go back to verse 3 here. Because he tells us here that this is something that happened at some time in our lives. He says here in verse 3, And by this we know that we, ha- we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Have gives you the idea that it was past tense. It was something that happened. For example, in my life, I was 14 years old. I remember going to this meeting. I remember hearing the gospel story. I remember hearing that, that Jesus loved me, had a place for me, wanted me to be with him. He, would, he was totally willing to forgive me and save me. And all I needed to do was confess my sin and, and he would change my life. And you know what? I'm heart beating. I remember I made that decision and I prayed and asked Christ to come into my life. And you know what? Things began to change. That doesn't mean I was perfect. That doesn't mean I didn't fall and stumble and do some dumb, stupid things. I did. But there was something inside of me that was changing. My heart's desire, my hope, my trust. It changes us. Verse 4 here is going to tell the very same thing here, but this time he's going to do it sort of in a negative way. Verse 4, he says, Whoever says they know him but does not keep his commands is a liar. That's a pretty strong statement, right? If you actually say you believe but then you don't obey, John here is saying you're lying. The Apostle Paul would actually even back this up. If you're in 1 John here, go back over to the left to go to Titus chapter 1. Right after 2 Timothy, go to Titus, chapter 1. Look what he says here in verse 16. He says, they profess to know God. Okay, stop for a second. This would be people then that would come out at this point, if this were here right now, they would say, well, I'm a Christian. So they profess to know God. He says, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable and disobedient and unfit for any good work. In other words, it's possible for people to be out there, just like there were in Asia Minor at this time, that think, well, I was born in America, my parents attended church, I show up at church, you know, and and, and so I guess I'm a Christian. No. Now, assurance of salvation is experienced. I obey, and because... I obey, I want to be more like Jesus. I have a sense that God is at work in my life. Now, evidence number two here is the issue of maturity. Look at verse five. He says, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we may know that we are in him. Him. 
Obedience at this point then shows the love of God is perfected in us. That term perfected there, really what it means is it's brought to maturity. It's growing up. The way it's used here makes it clear that it's God at work who is perfecting us and maturing us to the point that we really want to obey him. We want to do it. You know, there are three reasons why, as human beings, we do anything. Some people do stuff because they have to do it. For example, if you're in the military and you get an order, you have to go fulfill that. Maybe you're incarcerated and, and you know, you, the, the guards make you do it. I mean, they put you in jail. If you don't do it, you have to do something. Other people do something because they, they need to do something. Like, you know, I got bills, so I got to go to work, you know, and I need the paycheck, and I got to do that. I just got, I'm not ready to retire. I'm not independently wealthy, so I've got to do that. And then there are other people that do something because they want to. When you and I come to faith in Jesus Christ, this is supposed to be us. We're doing it because we want to. What John is saying here is if you love God, it will drive you to keep his commandments because you want to. That's what a mature love for God does. I want to. My love is being perfected. It's growing. It's maturing. It's getting stronger all the time. I mean, mean, think about it. Go back again to John chapter 14, verse 15 in the gospel there. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you have matured, if you got to this place where this relationship you have is not this, you know, thing that you do only on Sunday morning, but you actually have a relationship with me, you will keep my commandments. The evidence of a maturing love is it's less and less difficult to do what God wants. I mean, if you're struggling with obedience, you need to get honest with yourself about what it is you really love. What's really, you know, battling for your affections in your life. I mean, maybe it's pleasure, entertainment. Maybe it's family. I mean, in America today, that seems to be the the, the new God out there is family. We put family in front of everything else and I'm pretty sure Jesus would say that's probably not the right thing to do. Maybe it's ease. Maybe it's security. Drive. Money. I mean, I'll be honest with you. you A growing, mature love for Christ, a perfecting of your love in Christ should move you to be a faithful steward. I mean, you'll become a tither. There's no question about that. I mean, if you think about it for a second, when are you and I most like God? You ever thought about this? when we give. Did you know that? Because he's a giver. Was it that you love the most? I mean, if you're saying I love God, but then you don't obey, John's point here is that's not true. You're not telling the truth. You're deceiving yourself. You love something else more. Listen, regardless of the command If my faith is maturing and I'm growing in Christ, regardless of what the command is, I ought to be loving him enough to go, okay, God. I mean, I cannot imagine that that anybody out there would, would, would stop and go, well, you know what, I think that these people that somehow they decided to go off to the mission field and they went to some third world country and go, well, I guess they just really wanted to go there all by themselves. I don't think so. I think what it was was God told them, I want you to go do this. And their love for Christ was like, okay, I'll do it. What John is saying here is when you and I come to faith in Christ, not only does he save us, but his love begins to change us and to control us. And it's not drudgery to obey. I love him and I obey him because I do. Now, you get to verse 6 here, and he's going to give us the third evidence, and that is lifestyle. The first one was obedience. The second one was maturity. The third one here is lifestyle. Look what he says, verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 
Verse 6 tells us that we start to pattern our lives after Christ. He uses the the metaphor walked here. It's all about conduct. It's how I live my life. Now, I realize that there are probably some people who are going, you know what, that sounds completely impossible to try to be like Jesus or to live like Jesus. I mean, why even try? But John's point is, if I'm in Christ and if I abide in him and I have a genuine faith, then the one thing that I will continue to do even when I fall is pursue the model. Chase Christ. Try to be like him, to walk with him, to do what he does. It ought to be my heart's desire. I mean, think about it for a second here. If you just examine your heart for a minute, why do you obey God? I mean, some people might honestly say, well, I obey him out of fear. You know, I'm afraid of what he'll do if I don't do it. Others will say, well, you know, I, I, I probably obey because of peer pressure because my family and people around me and all that kind of stuff. I will tell you that ultimately you are going to obey what you love the most. When it counts the most, you will obey what you love the most. Keep your finger here. I want you to go over to the first gospel to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Look what he says here in verse... Verse 21. Let's start even before that. Well, we'll start at 21. He says, for where your treasure is, Jesus said, there will your heart be also. Let me see if I can explain it to you, put that in English for you. The thing that you love the most is ultimately what you'll obey. That's what you'll chase. The question is, is that Christ? To walk as Jesus walked means our lives have to be characterized by a genuine love and faith in him. You can know at that point that you are saved by living obediently, by having faith that is maturing, by it's becoming easier for you to do what God is asking you to do, and by the fact that verse 6 tells us that we will want to follow his example. You know, there are a lot of people in churches around America today that lack assurance of their salvation. And so often they tend to look at the imperfections in their life and they just, you know... They just think it's impossible. John here is not telling us that if you love God, you'll never sin again. That's not what he's saying. In fact, he's actually saying the opposite. In verse 8, he tells us, look, if you sin, or excuse me, if you say you don't sin, you're actually lying. But don't worry about it. Go to the Father, confess it. He will forgive you. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, look, you've got this advocate. You've got this attorney pleading your case. You're going to be fine. What he's saying is that we can know that the love of God has been implanted in our hearts by our obedience, by our growing love and maturity, and by the fact that I want to be like him. It's always been God's plan. This was a huge thing in the the, the original church too, to the point that they said this, they would call each other Christian. Do you know what that term means? Little Christ. It's like we might say today, like, well, you know, like if if you've got a child that's like a lot like you, they go, well, they're just a chip off the old block. That's what we're supposed to be when it comes to Jesus. He's the model. I pursue the model. You know, some of you would be asking, do we really need to worry about assurance? Is that really all that important? Well, the biblical writers thought it was pretty important. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 for a minute. Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 22. Hebrews 10, verse 22 says this, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the writer of Hebrews thought this assurance was a big deal. Paul thinks it's a big deal. Go back over to the left to 2 Corinthians 13. 13. 
2 Corinthians 13 says this, verse 5. It says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about you, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? You ought to be asking these questions. Am I different? Am I any different at all than, than the rest of the world? Jesus would even broach this whole subject too of, are you really a believer? Go over Matthew chapter 7. It's not just his followers. Matthew chapter 7. In fact, we'll just start at verse 21. I know I said 22 to the guys up here, but we'll look at verse 21 even before that. Let me sort of set this up for you. There were people that were following Jesus around and they really liked the things that he did. He was the greatest show in town. I mean, people would be sick, he'd heal them. There'd be nothing to eat, he'd feed them. I mean, he did some really cool, amazing things. And yet when he would confront them about did they have a real faith, not all of them did. Could be like any church in America today, right? So he says this, starting in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now stop for a second. When they repeat the thing like that, when it says, Lord, Lord, that's a Hebraic. And that it means it communicates um, intimacy and affection and all those things like that. So you know, clearly he says these people think that they know God. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, again, the affectionate thing, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? In other words, didn't I do all this religious stuff? Isn't that what gets me in? Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Listen, there were people in Asia Minor when John wrote that were confused. They had no assurance at all of their faith. They really didn't even know they were in. They were hearing two sides of the story. So John, he writes to very clearly tell them, look, if you're really a believer, you will become obedient. And then your faith will begin to mature. That love will be perfected inside of you and it'll be easier and easier. In fact, you'll even get to the point that you're going to want to be like my son. You're going to want to be like Jesus. If these things are true of you, you should have the assurance because you'll know, you'll see it in your actions. You'll see it in a change inside of you. The question is, do you have that assurance? Or are you guessing? Would you pray with me? Appreciate if just for a second you could bow your heads for a minute. Maybe just close your eyes and there's not anything uniquely spiritual about you doing any of those things. But they do allow you to focus in on you. The question is, in your heart of hearts, is your faith real? And if it's real, has it shown up in any way? Do I obey the Lord? Is my life and my faith being perfected, maturing on a regular basis? It's becoming easier to follow the Lord. Do I actually desire to be like Jesus? These are the assurances, the evidence that John puts out there that you are in the faith. And if it's not true of you, maybe this morning is the time that you get those things cleared up. I want to encourage you that after we're done this morning, there's going to be a group of people down here right at the front that they just consider it their ministry to stop and pray for people. I'd encourage you that if you're not sure about that, come down and pray. Someone would love to be there to talk with you and to pray with you and encourage you.
Father, would you move in our hearts for us to know for certain, God, that we walk with you by simply looking at the acts of our lives to see the obedience by knowing that you are changing our hearts and it becomes easier for us every day, God, to walk with you and, Lord, that we ultimately want to be like your son. Let that be true of us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you love Jesus, if you trust in Jesus, live like you do. Live like you love him in front of a lost world so they can see what it looks like to be changed. God bless you.